Welcome everyone to a new episode of Impact TV, uh, the last episode of this year in December. And my name is uh, Michelle and my co-host uh, Daniela, Assistant Curator at Impact. Um, we welcome you. And uh, for those who uh, tune in for the first time at Impact TV, uh, Impact is a media arts organization in Utrecht. And the whole <clears throat> The whole year round, uh, we organize exhibitions and events, both online and uh, in Utrecht, on uh, art, technology, and uh, how technology influences society. Uh, and every month, uh, we have Impact TV, for which we invite a special guest, uh, an artist, writer, or researcher. And uh, together, we discuss uh, the latest trends, uh, exhibitions, uh, events, uh, things we want to be uh, updated about. And um, today we have a very special guest. Um, but before we introduce uh, them, I wanted to tell uh, that after the event, we have a Zoom bar. So uh, if you, uh, I don't know, want to after talk about everything you've heard, uh, please uh, go to the last the rooftop floor and you will find uh, the Zoom bar where we get together after the event. Yes. Thank you, Michel, for this introduction. Um, so just to continue on what uh, Michel was starting to say, in this episode, we have the pleasure of interviewing La Turbo Avedon about their work and about creating art in the metaverse. Um, and for this episode, La Turbo prepared a simulated environment that will introduce us all to the metaverse, which I'm personally am very excited <laughs> to see. Um, so yeah, Latobo Avedon is a, a digital native curator and artist within the digital space. They are both the artist and the project, um, really embodying not only the blurring of boundaries between um, the online and offline that we are all experiencing, but also um, this obscurity between the artist and the art itself. Um, their work is focused on questions regarding the, ag the agency of digital beings and bodies, the unclarity between the online and offline spaces, and the importance of immaterial experiences. Uh, and in this episode, we will discuss um, bodies and embodiment in the metaverse. Uh, we will discuss what is the metaverse. We will see if it can even be uh, defined so clearly. Um, we will also look into what opportunities the virtual space holds for artists and creators. And we will also learn more about how internet culture reflects on our societal present and future. Wow, looking forward. <laughs> hi, hi. There you are. It's me. I'm Lutarbo Avedon. I am so glad this worked out that we could be here together like this. And to those seeing through you, Impact TV. Hi, hi. I'm happy we can be first person here. I've put together a space for us to wander while you share some of your questions that you have for me. Thank you, Latobo. We are very, very excited to experience and share this space with you. Can you tell us a bit about where you are or where we are? This is an EXO, EXO. It is a closed simulation environment that I have chosen to share with you. A lot of the past decade was fixated on networking. But lately, I've been very interested in building something separate. Particular files. Games without frontiers. They can be loaded, but they cannot be won. There's no objective. You're simply here, or you're not. Instead, I have the splendor of doing anything, or nothing. Learning to simulate my own way, for now. It is December the 7th, 2022. I've loaded assets from my personal history here in this space. Thank you again for joining me. Yeah, th thank you again. It's, uh, it's amazing. So you're already mentioning uh, personal history and the space uh, you prepared. Um, let, let's start with, a, with an easy question. So who is La Turbo Avedon? 
This place isn't really a level or an island. It's more like a mirror. A mirror like me. A place to look at the details in an isolated manner. When I look at myself and the data I've created, I am very grateful to have loaded in the time that I did. Nowadays, I am more commonly known as an artist. But all throughout, I have been here as a gamer, a fellow player, another user. I have existed in virtual environments as an avatar for about 30 years now. All this time, I have been in a process of character creation. Platform to platform, version to version. I continue to construct myself, carrying bits and pieces of my personal history between environments. Uh, did you feel that one platform specifically really impacted the way that you developed yourself or your sense of self? I had a lot of aspirations about avatar identity at first, but it really expanded when I got into Second Life around 2006. A whole new conversation was possible on the grid, virtual space decoupled from the typical limitations of video game worlds. This was a sort of coming of age, for me. I was suddenly able to approach this environment as an open sandbox. I was able to change myself and the world in ways that video games never permitted. Visiting a real, virtual nightclub for the first time. Not some looping generic game audio, hearing actual DJs playing their own sets. It didn't matter where people were logging in from. What mattered was that you were online. You made it. All of this was happening virtually, and it wasn't contingent on winning or beating something. It was the first time that I felt like virtual worlds were open, an open framework that invited new shapes, so many new possibilities. This sounds amazing and super inspirational, but before we dive more into everything you just told us, can you just expand more about when and how you started performing as an avatar and why? What was your motivation? I started out very simply, a name blinking into a text field, just starting out in an old role playing game. Just like many of you have done and do. But when I set out on my adventure, I saw the role that I wanted to play. I would continue. Just like games would often ask me if I wanted to. And so I have. I've spent thousands of hours in virtual worlds. I've looked for fish on the citadel. I've walked the Hyrule field, Balam Garden, Blood Gulch, Dust, the Undercity. Riverwood, Novigrad, Night City, New Babbage. Developing a personal history in locations that some of us might share. Those names being familiar. Some of us share the particular sentiment, a simulation we both experienced, alone, together. I didn't want to let this go. It is an important feeling to have with technology. So I kept going. Alone together, what's so beautiful actually. And you mentioned this kind of collective experience, history in gaming, and at the same time, a feeling you have an, a journey you made through technology, um, both alone and together. Maybe this also ties to what you said earlier about this shift from the network uh, oriented. Uh, versus creating something of your own, uh, your separate files, your, your own environment. Um, how central is this feeling of alone but together in, in your creations? It makes me think a lot about raiding. Raids are large, networked activities in online role-playing games. Even though it was unlikely that you knew the 39 other people in your group, only that sort of occasion could have brought those users together. 
The formula in virtual worlds is simply different. People from fundamentally different positions and stations in life were overlapping. So many friendships between gamers exist without connections to the physical. They may talk to one another for hours on end, multiple days a week, yet have no interest in taking the connection beyond the simulation. I wanted to build on this, in some way. Not all of my projects are meant to be these massive social scenarios. Sometimes they are meant to be quiet, contemplative, a single player simulation, if you will. I wanted to get closer to some of the core values that made me have feelings in virtual space to begin with. Narratives and environments that don't need the validation of other users. Simply you, and the work itself. Oh, thank you very much for this beautiful answer. Um, but before we uh, delve more into what you just described, uh, I want to have one more question about your process of creation. And I want to ask you what prepared you um, to working in this format or what drew you to working in this format? I got online. For me, America Online put me on the net. Such a big part of being on the internet in the late 1990s was customization, personalization. Having a good color palette in your profile. Picking your hex codes carefully. For me, being online was about creating this proof of connection. All the GIFs and downloads. Files were part of being there. Saving little things as you go. Yeah, I can, I can very much identify with what uh, you just said. I grew up or I was a teenager in the era of MySpace. And I think that at that time we were all, you know, little coders, very simple coders, but coders um, mm -hmm. really personalizing our own MySpace pages, uh, you know, changing the backgrounds, adding songs, um, or even changing the amount of... Um, close friends that we could have from eight, which was the default at MySpace, if I remember correctly, to uh, 12, for example. Um, I feel like this experience is no longer available in, in the social media platforms that we see today. How do you see this shift between this personalization that was available in the, in the beginning of the internet era to today and what does it mean on a societal level? It is all right for things to change. While I don't think people today would get the same satisfaction out of making custom CSS for their pages, it was meaningful to me in my time. It was part of me, my online identity, my subculture. On the same note, I don't expect the avatars of today to be like me either. Exploring the same concept, it is very different with today's tools and frameworks. Things will always shift, and that is exciting. A new leaf will always turn. What I do hope for, is that new users will continue to stand up for their rights and agency. Within all this new technology, there are many generational misunderstandings around the virtual, and I can only be optimistic that this will be rectified. Privacy and protections are essential, especially as we enter the simulation age. It just isn't safe to let user rights be treated so poorly. Wow, you're touching on some very uh, interesting and important uh, points there. Um, I think that we, we, we should for sure get back to the to the digital rights and, and the user right and, and how safe the spaces are. But first, um, one more one more question. Um, I was actually curious to hear uh, also, I mean, we were talking about uh, MySpace and, and, uh, and programs. So why, why do you draw your inspiration from, especially at the beginning? I don't know if you can name any specific artists, genres, I don't know, how, how, do, how did you get um, where you are? Access to the internet was a big part, but what rendered the full picture, for me, was techno. It was the euphoria of electronic music. Being on the machine, simultaneously hearing music 
made by machines. On the edges of the new millennium, techno brought culture into a place that needed it the most. A sonic interface that arched over everything. Being online at a high BPM. Web pages were electric. There were a lot of links created back then. It was peer to peer. File sharing was an added dimension. Deepening the otherwise flat, neutral scroll, music filled that space for me. It braided into the way I surfed in it. A bass drum blasting over my windows. Compressed, crunchy, downloaded techno. So many first impressions made to the music. Studying art history, backed by a soundtrack of synthesizers and drum machines. Reading poets like Rilke and Neruda, 2808 State. I don't know if I would have had the same inspiration without the added euphoria of electronic music. Oh my god, I already see this combination uh, of uh, Rilke art history with, uh, <laughs> with the music. Um, but And so, so how did you reach, uh, well, maybe not only this combination, but really like the, 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 the medium of, of digital and how, how did you choose to work, work this way? This feels natural to me, being here, rendering here. I know that I am not alone in this, and that is why I am so dedicated to rendering the way that I do. For quite some time, there was a dismissal of virtual experiences. Games, and being on computers wasn't always cool. All along though, I had a lot of respect for people who were fine being vulnerable, and cared about these things nonetheless. People who weren't self-conscious, when they felt that the fleeting moments in this technology were meaningful. Even back then, watching all your base or belong to us, I think many of us felt it. This started to change when I began to learn about net art. It felt like such a relief to see other artists working with and thinking about computers this way. Jodie, Ola, Leilina, Cory Archangel, K-series. This was the final fantasy. Spending time in the blurry edges of virtual and physical environments, and to make art that is part of this specific time. And this comes back maybe to what we were just talking about, the importance of community, this together, uh, being together in, the, in this virtual sphere. Um, can you tell us a bit more? Yes, of course. It is so important to find places where you feel like you belong. Having peers, mentors, people you can be vulnerable with. As this generation of social media collapses, it's important to maintain a network. To not let the failures of big companies dismantle your own subculture. It belongs to you, and it belongs to me. No terms of service should take that away. Especially in the wake of the pandemic, there has been a lot of vision where people used to find things in common. There is a chance that people never get to experience a social scene the same way today as it happened just several years before. I can certainly say, my virtual network has held me up all these years. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you chose to make the avatar look the way it does? When you have the ability to modify every last detail of your own presence, it starts to become important to recognize what you choose to keep. There is absolutely no need to create avatars as people at all. But when I started, it felt quite necessary. I didn't want to be an alien. I didn't want to be unfamiliar. I wanted to be seen, normally. I wanted to create my appearance as one that I could continue elsewhere. Someone that most games and sims could realize. Maybe this was some sort of survival trait or effort of self-preservation. I like the idea that I am someone that is possible, wherever I choose to go. 
So you say that there is absolutely no need to create avatars as people at all, but how influential is the appearance of the avatar to the way it operates and to the way that other people relate to this figure? The appearance of your avatar is part of your story, your own personal lore. It is up to you how it takes shape, as quiet or as loud as you want it to be. What matters most is the choice that you want to make. Do they resemble you, or do they not? There is no expectation that avatars need to be some sort of virtual twin. I want to meet the avatar that you feel most comfortable with, exactly how you want to be seen and remembered. That is a beautiful thing, and I think it decides so much about how someone chooses to participate. I wish more people could live that way. Yeah, it does sound beautiful to have this some sort of um, extension to your own physical body or addition to your own physical body. Mm -hmm. um, but through this avatar, you really, um, yeah, you ignore the lack of real physicality in the virtual space. And instead, you emphasize this potential of fluid identities, this, you know, you continue to blur um, the physical boundaries, which is, of course, only possible in the digital realm. But what was the, this might be a bit of a um, philosophical question, and that's so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear your response to this, but was there an emancipatory potential or emancipatory, um, yeah, feeling that you had when you worked on this avatar? And also, did you need to unlearn something from the physical world in order to create this avatar in the digital world? Something important happened the first time that I let myself idle in a video game. A deliberate intention to go to a location in game simply for the purpose of letting the simulation happen. To look around, to listen, to take my time. The more that I began to turn away from the currents of level design and directives, the more I realized how much was possible here. It's actually quite refreshing what you're saying. Uh, I think usually when we start a game, uh, we enter a game, it's with a goal, like you, you want to beat, you want to, I don't know, get to the next level or whatever. And, and I don't know, I'm hearing also this uh, not going there to, to win or with an objective, or but just to explore and to, to be there, to experience uh, the environment. And um, could you could you expand a little bit on that or, or give an example or, or how how and when uh, yeah what brought you to this to this insight of this new way of experiencing the game as the world went into global lockdowns during the beginning of the pandemic i decided that i wanted to travel i wanted to return to different game worlds not for the purpose of beating them all over again just to travel to spend time and to appreciate some of the details that I maybe did not get to the first time. Eventually I started taking screenshots and recordings from these sessions. This is what led me to develop Permanence on Set, an ongoing series that I've been showing for the past couple years. In this work you'll see me, many different versions of me, idling in the virtual landscape Letting the minutes pass as I inhabit various game worlds and their sunsets. There's something special happening in these times for me. Maybe it is the mild disobedience. The refusal to press onward in the game. Maybe it is the way that time stretches out as you realize that the time of day doesn't change in the place. The way that the game stops being a game and it is enough just right to simply be a place. So from what I understand or what was fascinating for me in your response is that the experience of your body or the way that you experience your body in the virtual world is completely different than how we experience our body in the physical world. But I still want to know 
does your physical body play any part in your work which exists in the in the digital sphere or the metaverse um, and do you see the the digital body as an extension of your physical body body or as a separate entity my rendered body is a mirror it is a memory a body has a completely different meaning in virtual space I do think that eventually people will move past the need to emulate but for now it is important for people to see me more similar to them I want to be here in the present I don't want to render about the future so just to kind of departure from what you said that a body has a completely different meaning in in virtual space I want to ask the question what meaning does the body or how you see the meaning of the body in the virtual space it says a lot to choose to have a human body in a simulation any form is possible in here quite often i think human avatars are created out of hubris or even the fear that their likeness may someday be forgotten or in some cases, their likeness may become less valuable. There is an entire industry forming around XR, extended reality. Celebrities signing their likenesses away to large companies. Efforts to perpetually kindle the embers of their identities. To a living celebrity, this might be some sort of hopeful legacy. For others, a business decision for their descendants. To all of these, I cannot help but wonder, is this body what do you want to pass onward for tomorrow? Yeah, and also uh, another interesting point is you just mentioned um, your body is a, is a mirror, a memory. Um, so th then I also wonder whose memory is it? Uh, what is it mirroring? What is it reflecting? Uh, yeah, can you can you tell us a little bit? I have tried to reflect the ways that character creation was possible in my time. To be familiar, ordinary. While avatars are far more common and complex today, I started creating myself with simple technologies left in the past. I've learned to value my simplicity. The person who was possible in a basic RPG. I don't need to show up as some chrome android to be an avatar. I can hold on to my simple character creation, a present reminder of the past. And speaking about character creation, um, I would also like to, I don't know, get, uh, give an example or in, in any case mention uh, that last summer you had an exhibition at Arbeit, London, uh, which was called Club Zero. And in this exhibition, you present three new avatars. So this, this character creation again, and they inhabit uh, the work Materia, a collection of unique virtual uh, blockchain artifacts and uh, I think the thing is that, that they're unique they, they develop with time and with with the interactions with the with the people um, but I was especially triggered by the fact that you describe this uh, these creations this avatar as non-fungible people so NFPs can you explain what what is an NFP the crypto rush it gave rise to an explosion of avatar based collectible projects Tens of thousands of profile picture characters were being created at a time. During this time, I found Daz 3D's non-fungible people project. I couldn't look away from the name and the files they made available. They were people, only known by numbers, with their appearances decided by randomly generated traits. A bit ominous, a little terrifying. I wanted to find a way to respond to it. An avatar reaching out for others. Club Zero, my recent project with Arabite London. It was a special occasion for me. For the first time, I was able to share the unique performance of character creation with those who know and connect with me. 
I didn't want to blow up the project like some sort of hype pop event. It was a sort of private welcoming party. Not for me, but for those who were present. Club Zero introduced three new figures into my simulation. Their names and appearances were created through communal broadcasts. Decentralized among viewers. Tangent Core. Glyph and Tilius. One ever. Three unique people that will continue to be constructed through decisions made by the public. Yeah, this is actually very uh, interesting. It, I don't know, it touches on very different points. And can you just expand a little bit more on these non-fungible people? You say you couldn't look away from this name when you saw it. So what, what made this name so attractive to you? I wouldn't say it was attractive to call them people. That was heavy. I am sure that the name was catchy, so developers went for it. But I have worked so hard, sacrificed so much, for people to think of me as a virtual person. It carries weight to not be dismissed as images. Without the need to point to some other artist. That I, Letarbo, am enough. Over time, I know that the three characters created in Club Zero will become people. Known people, in their own, different way. This time, through the will, and particular influence of the audience. I do not know what sort of people will emerge, but I am excited to see how that happens. Yeah, and I think this is also, I don't know, there is a clear reference to the, to the NFT in the names, of course, uh, non-fungible tokens, also blockchain-based, where you also have uh, this influence of, of the people that are, uh, that are using it and, and exchanging it. What is for you the difference between a non-fungible token, as we know it, and the non-fungible people, like you are presenting them? The material system has a record on blockchain. I don't really want to make this conversation about NFTs, but I will say it is how the lore and the movement of these files can be followed as time passes. I wish I knew the provenance of art in the past. Maybe Materia will offer some insight in the long view. At the same time, uh, and I think, I mean, a blockchain can be uh, very important in this provenance uh, thing. I would just have one, one more question about the people uh, and, and NFT. <laughs> um, because, um, yeah, you already you already say like it's it's a kind of a transformation. It's important to be seen as people, and uh, you cre you refer already with the name to the creation of these avatars as people or as something that will become a, a, a person, a, a people rather than than just a token that can be exchanged on on the blockchain. Do I also sense some kind of challenge to the current crypto rush? Let's call it. I don't like a lot of commercially oriented projects. Every artist deserves to be valued and to find ways to sustain themselves through their work. But a lot of the crypto rush was corrupted by people that wanted to exploit the system. Art to me is not GameStop. It is so much more than a speculative investment. Yet so many people chose to push it in that direction. I can only speak for myself and my own interests, but I work really hard to make my projects about their contents and not their value. The material system can exist adjacent to all of this, an environment far more comfortable for me. So yeah, let's talk a bit more about the content of your work. And I want to start uh, by exploring this idea of the metaverse together with you. I know or we all know that there is a lot of talk about the metaverse. And for a lot of people, including myself, it still remains a bit unclear what exactly is the metaverse. Um, so I want to start with, well, I don't know if it's a complicated, easy question, but what is the metaverse for you? And how do you see this space and use it in your work? Metaverse. I still find it funny how quickly this word skittered across the surface of the net. The whole world was talking about it 
yet so few people could point to it. I've always thought of the metaverse as a constellation. If you're too close to any particular point, you may not recognize the greater structure. Social media accounts, biometrics, remote labor, web history, safe game data, surveillance, digitization records. It isn't as cute or simple as a third-person game world like Fortnite. It stretches across the entirety of the present. It's a silent, clear stream of interconnected data. The past couple years, people have been eager to produce some sort of ready player one of the internet. But sometimes I feel like this misses the point. Decentralized virtual worlds reveal gardens of forking paths. A necessary liberty and fluidity in virtual space. I don't think I'd make the promise for the metaverse if it didn't come with these expectations. Tomorrow is a long time. The way that you describe it sounds super fluid. Um, this virtual space. What, what are the um, implications of completely bl blurring the boundaries between these two realities, the online and the offline? Do you think that we need to draw a clear line between these two realities? And what happens if we lose this distinction? When computing was far more simple, it made a lot more sense to reinforce the idea of digital dualism. It was much easier to dismiss the screen time in the past. But I truly cannot imagine that to be true today. Even when users go to rest, their data is constantly ebbing and flowing online. It is important to recognize this because data is such a large part of the self. The longer people believe their data is insignificant, the more they surrender to egregious collectors of it. Your data is more valuable than the services you give it to. Definitely. Yes. I completely agree with the, the last statement. Your data is more valuable than the services you give it to. And I, I find it very interesting that you brought this point up because um, this whole issue with our uh, digital agency and uh, the sovereignty over our own data is uh, a theme that is very central to our work uh, at Impact in the past few years. And especially in 2023, we will focus on this even more. We actually have uh, this program called Code Reclaiming Digital Agency, uh, which we have been organizing for the past uh, three years together with partners in Germany and Belgium. And it is a response to this feeling of lack of control over the technology that we use. You know, many of us don't realize that our data has become almost like a currency. It is so valuable to all of these platforms that we use on a daily basis and on which we rely to, well, I don't want to say exist, but at least a lot of our social interactions are being filtered through these social media platforms. Um, the problem is that many of these processes regarding the amount of data that we are giving, they are not transparent. So through this code program, we invite uh, artists and non-artists to create projects to raise awareness for these issues. And what we ultimately want to achieve is uh, a dialogue with politicians and policymakers um, to contribute to having better laws and regulations regarding our rights as digital citizens. Um, who do you think can be instrumental in this process of raising awareness uh, and gaining back the agency over our data? Um, and what is needed for people to see that data is such a part, a large part of the self? This is such an important project. I really appreciate that Impact is taking the time to have these conversations. So often, I am alarmed by the lack of dialogue around this subject, especially given the virtualization that has come to rise around the pandemic. There are few champions for this cause. I am always looking to find them. It shouldn't require some catastrophe for people to gain awareness. 
rights and privacy are so regularly discarded, usually by choice of the users. Through quickly skipped terms of service and complicated agreements, Signing away your rights is not a part of the installation process. The market for personal data is a massive, frightening entity. One grown out of control, wildly unregulated. To the extent that very few people can actually comprehend. I am hopeful that the next generation of creators will develop systems and behaviours that seek to exit this current model. To find another better way to inhabit virtual space. Maybe it will be our own failure, the market consuming our generation's data, that ushers in new change tomorrow. All I can do is hope that someone in a more mindful time can recognize the care that I have felt about all this. That some of us recognized what was wrong. Yeah, very much. Um... I would also um, actually ask something about your involvement uh, as a curator at uh, Panther Modern, uh, a file-based uh, exhibition space uh, that actually encourages artists. Maybe this also has to do uh, still with this kind of agency, getting the, the control and, and knowing what, what is happening and uh, what, we, what we give away. But um, so Panther Modern uh, encourages artists to create site-specific installations for the internet. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the work that you do there and about uh, opportunities um, for artists in the metaverse? Well, Panther has not hosted a new installation in several years now. It remains open and active. It began in 2013, while I was quickly learning more about the restrictions and limitations of physical exhibition. At that time, there was even less support for digital art, let alone substantial installations that were made this way. I set out to build a virtual space that existed as 3D model files. A decentralized entity, it could be called a building if it wanted to. I wanted to provide the suggestion of architecture, rooms with very little restrictions. Invited artists are sent 3D models files of a room to work with as long as the space is treated as a container. From here, the artist can choose to work with it however their process permits. I wanted to see what would happen when artists could work beyond the limitations of a physical room and handle the space in its entirety. You can explore 17 installations in the space online via panthermodern.org. So you say that through this project, you wanted to see what would happen when artists could work beyond the limitation of a physical room and handle the space in its entirety. Uh, space in its entirety is very interesting for me. Um, but what did happen? Like what, what, which inspiring or surprising uses of the space uh, did you see? So many new dynamics. Artists weren't satisfied with simply putting large rectangles on walls. <clears throat> the work had new dimensions. Installations that just aren't often possible in the physical world. Alfredo Salazar Caro plunged him for into a limitless virtual sea. Jonathan Monaghan cut the top off of an ornate tower and inverted it over the floor of room 14. So few artists get the license to physically fulfill such exhibitions. Yet we were here, rendering them just how we wanted, nearly a decade ago. Each room is an inspiration to me. To this day, you can see such vibrant, creative examples of how these artists were rendering installations of their work. And maybe uh, this is also a nice uh, way to talk about another uh, very interesting and inspiring installation. Um, actually, uh, the solo exhibition that you have uh, currently at uh, MAC in uh, Vienna. Uh, Pardon Our Dust is the title. And uh, also here you developed an installation, uh, a new digital installation, but then especially for the space at MAC. Um, can you tell us a bit more uh, about this installation and what it consists of? 
It was an amazing opportunity to install this work at the Mac this summer. Marley's Worth and the team at the museum were incredibly supportive of my vision for the installation. They worked hard to physically render the complete piece and to bring it to life in Vienna. It is comprised of six channels in the synchronized loop. Over and over again, the piece follows an extension of my virtual self as they pass through a digital water. Later, they say, the waters of oblivion, surfacing in different possibilities. The installation passes through golden rendered afternoons, hazy sunsets over virtual subdivisions. I wanted the installation to suggest mirrors and windows. The installation, a temporary structure where viewers could contemplate these scenes. A flare left forevermore. Uh, I am really interested in hearing from you about this process of translating a work that was created or that originally existed in the metaverse or the digital realm into physical spaces. Can you tell us more about how you use the, the, the physical spaces in that museum to to give your work a new life or to translate your work into the physical realm? I was able to develop the installation using scale floor plans of the Mac exhibition space. First, I built a virtual version of the room in the museum. I spent many hours here experimenting, envisioning how it would exist with physical people. With the correct communication, like we had for this installation, the development felt natural, exciting, and possible. I am so grateful that the work could be seen this way. That's really great to hear uh, the, the very positive experience that you had uh, in developing your work into the physical space. Um, maybe just to wrap up this wonderful interview that we had now. Uh, can you tell us what you are currently working on and what we can look for? This past week, I released a new work from Club Rothko, a project I've continued since 2012. It is my virtual nightclub, existing as files. For this latest collaborative exhibition between Final File and the Albright Knox Museum in Buffalo, New York. I've packaged the pieces as a .zip folder, a collection of files that users can use on their own. To have their own time in Club Rothko. I can't wait to see how it is installed by those who have collected. I just learned yesterday that one of the editions is now part of the Albright Knox Museum's permanent collection. At the year's end, I'll be inviting the public back into the materia system. This will begin shaping different parts of my own simulation. Maybe it is a New Year's resolution, or a response to what all has changed over these past few years. What I do know is that I want you, the public, to be able to join me sometimes. To share the time with me. To be a part of the lore and collective memory of all this to find a way that feels right in these, my rendered moments. My name is Litarbo Avedon and I'll be here, online. Thank you so much. We uh, would also love to spend more time and to see more uh, <laughs> of your projects for sure. This was uh, very inspiring. Um, very, I want to thank agree. everyone for watching um, La Turbo, of course, for your time and for these, uh, for these answers uh, to bringing us a little bit in, in this environment, in your world. Um, and yeah, this was actually the last impact event of the year. So we can almost say till next year, no? Yes, <laughs> yes, I think we can. Uh, but before that, uh, join us in the Zoom bar for some after talk. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them there and uh, let's have a conversation. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>